An ordained Anglican priest who went to South Africa during the height of apartheid in 1973, he counseled school children who were arrested, tortured, and sometimes killed under the apartheid regime of the day. In 1976, he expelled from the country, landing in a small kingdom of Lesotho, where he later joined the ANC in exile, continuing his work mobilizing and conscientizing a lot of people to support the struggle for independence. In 1982, following a police raid that left 42 people dead, Father Michael Lapsley relocated to Zimbabwe, where he continued to champion the struggle. He was put on the South African hit list. Soon after Nelson Mandela's release from Robben Island, Father Michael Lapsley received a puzzle bomb that resulted in him losing both his arms and an eye. In 1993, he became chaplain for the Trauma Center for Victims of Violence and Torture in Cape Town, which assisted the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This work led to the establishment in 1998 of the Institute Healing of Memories in Cape Town. The Institute of Hearing of Memories aims to allow many more South Africans to tell their stories in workshops where they work through their trauma. Father Michael Lapsi is also the author of Redeeming the Past, My Journey from Freedom Fighter to Healer. Today, Father Michael Lapsi joins us in our studios right here in New York. Father Michael Lapsi, welcome to Sahara TV. Thank you, Fungai, and uh, wish you well on Zimbabwe's Independence Day. Okay, thank you very much. So now South Africa is popularly been known as a pan-Africanist nation and also affectionately termed the Rainbow Nation. And recently it has also been described as a xenophobic nation. And in the past week, we've experienced, uh, South Africa has experienced black on black violence, especially to fellow Africans, and some have termed it Afrophobia. What is your take on what's going on there now? I, like countless South Africans, have a deep sense of shame. Um, this should never have happened. Um, and it is a great blot on the South African landscape. Uh, and many of us want to apologize to every person in South Africa who's been a victim uh, of xenophobia. And many of us are committed to doing everything in our power as citizens of South Africa to end xenophobia. Um, we, we as a nation owe an extraordinary debt of gratitude to people all over the world uh, for the success of the struggle against apartheid, but particularly from the continent of Africa, not least from southern Africa. And many of us, because of having lived for significant parts of our lives, not just in South Africa, but like myself and Lesotho and Zimbabwe, we feel ourselves to be Southern Africans. So I think there's a, an extra dimension of pain and outrage at what is uh, currently happening uh, in South Africa. And I think it's, it's, it's causing a, uh, a great amount of soul searching throughout the nation about where are we going? How could this happen mm -hmm. in the Rainbow Nation? How could this happen at this point in our history? How could uh, people who have been victims become the victimizers of others? Right. So on your way here, I think I was following you on social media, and you made a posting where you said, uh, you're leaving South Africa, and before you left, you convened a meeting with people that work with you at the Institute, and you asked them what they think people in South Africa should do about this, and also as an institution, institution and also as individuals. And then you said also that there are two questions that come to your mind. One of them was, what are we against, and what are we for? So 
This is the question you ask yourself today. Yes. Uh, you see, that was a question that we learned to ask during the struggle to free South Africa and to keep on asking the question, mm -hmm. what is it we're against? What is it we are for? And, and in some ways during the apartheid years, it was very simple to say what we're against. Mm -hmm. It was a more challenging question to say what kind of society do we want? And I'm saying that we need to ask those questions afresh. Um, and so, of course, we need to continue to be against racism, against homophobia, against sexism, but also uh, against xenophobia and Afrophobia. Some people have, have pointed out that it's not correct simply to talk about Afrophobia at the moment because both Chinese and Pakistani citizens uh, in our country have also been the targets. So it does seem to be not simply African brothers and sisters, but mm -hmm. the other people from from other places. And of course, the irony is that even today, we South Africans are all over the world right. being welcomed and, and, and being received, and we are all over the continent of Africa. And of course, there are a significant number of political refugees in South Africa, but there are people who've come to South Africa simply there because they want a better life. Right. As people all over the world move seeking a better life for themselves and their families. Cool. And, and of course, what's also true is that many, many uh, foreign nationals found a home in South Africa. They, they are well settled in communities. Mm -hmm. Their children go to local schools. They are integrated and accepted, uh, and, which is why we should not think that most South Africans uh, are in favor of xenophobia. Uh, it reminds me a little bit, and I wrote about that, that um, when the far right in Germany came out in support of Nazi policies, mm -hmm. uh, German people came out in vastly greater numbers right against the far right, against Nazism. And I'm saying in South Africa, it's time for, if you like, the silent majority to, to, to be on the streets, to speak out and say, not in our name are you doing what you're doing. Right. So now, South Africa, is it a traumatized nation? Because in the past week, again, we've seen that they've been attacking statues of those colonialists, uh, understandably so, because there's so much anger. But it's... Is it a traumatized nation? Well, we are, we are 20 years into democracy. And I th think personally that there are many signs that we are still a traumatized nation. Um, there are fundamental economic questions of economic transformation and the, 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 the uh, skewed income distribution. You know, it's up the worst in the world. But at, at the same time, there are these signs of our trauma, and we see it in political violence, family violence, social violence. And my own view is that even as we struggle for economic transformation, we have to deal with our pain and our hurt and our trauma, because otherwise those who have unhealed wounds are very susceptible for their pain to be exploited for narrow political ends, either by political opportunists or by a criminal element. And in a sense, that is what we have seen, uh, that exploitation of the pain and the frustration and the anger that is there in many, in many uh, poor communities being used for violent ends. And a lot of people are saying that uh, probably King's Wellettini, Goodwill's Wellettini's comments about get rid of the foreigners, the foreigners must leave, and also supported by Edward Zuma, who's also the son of the, the president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, uh, supporting this same statement. Could this have I think it led underlines, or contributed? Yeah, it underlines the extraordinary responsibility in a volatile situation for the role of leaders. And leaders can inflame passions and send a signal, and later they say, oh, that's not what we meant. Right. Um, but it was precisely their words that appeared to give permission and sanction. Um, and I think there's a general feeling in the country that uh, Zulu King carries uh, mm -hmm. serious responsibility. But not only the Zulu King, but there's also a feeling that the state has not acted decisively 
and quickly and fully as possible, but also a recognition that we do have to look at the kind of grievances that there are in communities. Now, it's easy to scapegoat foreign nationals, but wherever communities live side by side, there will be issues that need to be mediated and dealt with uh, effectively. And it's true, people point out to the fact that we have porous borders and an overwhelming number of foreign nationals who live in South Africa lead uh, upright lives, contribute to our national economy. But just as we have our own criminal element, so there's a criminal element that comes from outside. And the actions of the few often um, give uh, affect the view people have of a majority, uh -huh. uh, where in fact we're talking about um, a small minority who, who are uh, behaving, behaving badly. badly. Okay, so now you've also spoken about trying to develop preemptive strategies in terms of responding to this uh, tragedy. What are those steps that you think well, you might... I live in Cape Town and, mm -hmm. and we have seen um, the xenophobic violence, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, to some degree in, in Hauteng. Um, but we notice what happened in 2008, particularly because of uh, social media and mainstream media, is that a story that happened in one part of the country will be picked up in another part of the country. And, 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 and we work on the ground with local uh, communities. And some of those communities, in fact, in 2008, were unbelievably impressive. When, when xenophobic violence took place in their communities, the community went door to door and got back back the property that was taken, went to foreign nationals, handed back the property that was taken, and said, you are welcome in our communities. So we are having a dialogue in those communities um, already about what kind of preemptive action. But also, we work with a large number of young people in, in a program called Restoring Humanity. Mm -hmm. And in that program, we have, uh, we've dealt with very extensively the theme of xenophobia, the whole issue of how we deal with the other, and we are intending to mobilize these young people to become activists at very grassroots level uh, against xenophobia and also to, to, to uh, find places where people can dialogue about their grievances rather than turn to violence. But also where back in 2008, before that, we used to have what we call healing of the memories workshops mm -hmm. with uh, refugees alone. Mm -hmm. Since 2008, we've never done that again. We always have South Africans and foreign nationals together in the same workshops, telling each other their stories. Because where people are kept apart, it's easy to develop stereotypes about each other. Right. But when you're exposed to each other's common humanity, then you're much less likely to be violent because, in fact, you discover the, the depth of uh, commonality that we all share. And you realize that the foreign nationals are people like us, just as South Africans are foreign nationals and other parts of the continent, other parts of the world, right. like you, my brother, in the United States of America. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I see that a lot of countries have also responded to this. I know uh, Malawi's uh, stepped in to try and, uh, you know, repatriate their people that are already in South Africa. I see that Ethiopia has condemned the acts. Uh, Mozambique, people have started responding by sending back and stopping South African vehicles carrying products and goods for business into the country. So how do you think this is going to escalate to what levels? Um, on, on Tuesday, there will be a meeting of um, all the major religious leaders in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, because perhaps the as the Council of Churches under the as part of the South African Council of Churches, but other other formations as well, other religious formations as right. well, because probably the most the way people in South Africa are the most organised is in the faith community. And I must say already, organisations like uh, the Diaconia Council of Churches, uh, the Mus the organisation with a Muslim background, Gift to the Giver, have been magnificent on the ground. Uh, communities of faith have acted. Uh, um, to protect foreign nationals, to act with generosity and compassion and kindness. And of course, those are the stories that don't necessarily create headlines.
Palestinians. But the faith community is certainly seeking to mobilize, um, to look for the lasting solutions, and, and, and to uh, give moral and ethical leadership to the nation at this time. Because the faith community is organized at every single level, down to the smallest, tiniest village of South Africa. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the overwhelming majority of South African people are religious. Uh, and of course, um, we are interconnected with faith communities across across the continent. Personally, I believe in the face of this xenophobe, but also in the face of the horror of, of, of Boko Haram, of what happened to the Kenyan students, that we need across the continent a new interfaith co coalition mm -hmm. that will be struggling um, for peace and reconciliation at every level of the continent. Because the xenophobic violence and the other extremist violence in the continent, everybody loses, nobody right. gains. Nobody's uh, a winner. And, 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 and you know, we in the mother continent, we have to find each other. I mean, the stories you were just repeating, uh, who, is, who gains from that? Everybody loses. Everybody loses. Uh, and, and, and we need people to have cool heads, but we need also uh, leaders of all communities with moral vision to give leadership to our people at this time. Okay, so I guess the whole world is praying for South Africa right about now. In fact, that was all we had time for. Thank you very much for joining us. This is obviously Father Michael Lapsley coming all the way from South Africa. He's also the author of Redeeming the Past, My Journey from Freedom Fighter to Healer. Father Michael Lapsley, thank you. Of course, he's a Kalele Africa the national anthem. God bless Africa, Africa, the whole continent. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm from Gamma Sahara TV.